We don't understand everything God doing and everything God does. And we're not even aware of all that He does. I mean, my goodness, you know, how many, how many times did your heart beat today? God knows. Okay? Uh, what about that? What about that flower that bloomed on somebody's black back porch today? When when exactly did it open up? God God knows that. And uh, yesterday morning the, the sunrise. Did y'all see that? Yes. That love note that God gives us every morning. And and I and I told you this. And and, uh, and I mean it with all my heart. I believe that those sunrises and sunsets. Uh, those are God's little color pictures that instead of hanging on our refrigerator, okay, he paints the whole sky up and so forth just for you and me because you see, uh, the, the deer, they can't acknowledge that sunrise. They just know it's daytime. And, uh, and the birds, they can't, they can't acknowledge the colors and the glorious things that God did with those colors, okay, and the rabbits. There's nothing in creation except for you and me that can acknowledge those colors when God spreads it across the sky. He loves them so much. If He could do that just for you and me, and in a few moments those colors dissipate and it just goes into a glorious day like it did yesterday, it's temporary, but God the Father planned it for you and me. He loves you. He's so intently aware of, of all those things, and time and time again He sits down. And he's, he's like knocking on your door trying to get your attention. He's painting those colors in the sky and I walked outside yesterday morning and I looked at that and I just stood just in amazement because there's no paints that man has ever made that makes the same colors and the hues as was this over the sky. And then I turned around. And as I looked around, it was in all, it was all the way around. I mean, he had painted it in all corners of the sky. It wasn't just on the eastern side. But God did up a special thing yesterday morning for us. And uh, I just celebrated those things for a moment out in the yard. He just looked out there. Just, Lord, thank you. Say, thank you. Got a call right before we walked into the sanctuary. It was my, it was my, uh, one of my granddaughters up there in Atlanta, uh, Abigail, uh, Stephen and Carly's baby. That's her, it's her first birthday today. And uh, they're celebrating that thing up there and, and so forth. And, and uh, I wish we could have made it up there, but Steve and Carly, they understand. They understand. They know where the importance of the ministry is and uh, so forth. And uh, we'll, we'll get to squeeze on her uh, pretty soon. And uh, we've got some gifts going, and, and <laughs> we're celebrating and that kind of thing. We, but uh, Loretta called me, my oldest granddaughter. And uh, she just wanted to talk to me for a little bit. And that was that was special, uh, you know, for her to stop and think about people uh, down here and wanted to talk to me. And she was at Abigail Grace's party, and, and she had had some cake, and she didn't want no ice cream tonight. And uh, she was telling me all about that. Her leg is healing up good, and she's back in tennis and playing and uh, so forth. For y'all that don't know it, uh, she dumped gasoline on her and caught herself on fire and had second and third degree burns and they were talking about skin grafts and all that type of stuff and praise God, God took away all of the nasty, nasty stuff and there was some ointment and rats and there's no third degree scars anymore and that second degree is all gone and she, she's, not had, she's not had to have any surgery, no skin grafts, nothing and God just took all that off of her. Okay. <coughs> Whatever the report was, there was going to be skin grafts and surgeries and all that kind of stuff and God took it all away. And if God can take it away from her, He can take away things from you. That's right. Amen. He loves you so much. God does special stuff for us. That sunrise yesterday morning was one of them. The sunrise this morning, oh, it wasn't as spectacular in, in how it wrapped all the way around. And it wasn't as bright with all the colors. But if you looked at it, God, God did Himself up proud on that one this morning too. Then is that as that color faded off and that clarity of that blue sky came through and so forth. It's amazing to me how the color can just kind of dissolve into clearness and blueness the way God does it in the sun. Okay? As He controls precisely everything. Okay? And He loves you and me. Tonight I want to... <clears throat> I want to go into his
Ezekiel with you. This has been on my heart. I want to, I want to go into Ezekiel chapter 36. Beginning at verse 16. Ezekiel chapter 36 verse 16. We're going to read a little bit. Now this is over the past sins of Israel. Or instead of the past sins of Israel, if you want to stick your name in the place of Israel, the past sins of uh, Brother Steve, the past sins of Sister Valerie, the past sins of Brother Carlton, Pee Wee, Larry, Linda. You can put your name where Israel was at in that sentence. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 16. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own way and by their own doings. Their way was before me as the uncleanliness of a removed woman. Wherefore I poured my fury upon them for the blood that they had shed upon the land and for their idols wherewith they had polluted it. And I scattered them among the heathen, and they were dispersed through the countries according to their way and according to their doings I judged them. And when they entered into the heathen, whither they went, they profaned my holy name. When they said to them, These are the people of the Lord, and are gone forth out of his land. But I had pity for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen, whither they went. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the heathen, whither you won't went. And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which you have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. For I will take from you, or I will take you from among the heathen, and gather you out of all countries, and will bring you unto your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. Verse 26. And a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you sh shall keep my judgments, and do them. Father, bless your word, Lord, in the reading of the word, Lord. Lord, send your Holy Spirit, quicken our minds, make it alive to your word. That, Lord God, we can absorb the meaning that you want us to have tonight. Lord God, your word is a your word is a living word. And Father, we can stand upon it and we can live by it. And Lord God, we never are in error if we're following your word. So, Lord God, take your heart. Take your, take your word. And hide it in our heart, Lord God, that we don't sin against you. That, Lord God, we can lift you up and exalt you in the way that you're entitled to be lit, exalted and lifted up in our lives. Lord, we can lift you up corporately in this place as a body of believers, but Lord God, we need to also lift you up separately and singly in our lives, Lord, as we're shut away in our closet and in our home. So, Lord God, work in us now with your Holy Spirit. Plant in us your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And I want to go through these verses with you because I want to talk to you tonight about some past sins of Israel. God is interested in what you've already done. There's some of us that sit down and on a daily basis almost look through our lives and, and we're scared to step out in front of somebody and talk about the Lord because of what we did yesterday or, or two years ago or five years ago. The life we used to live. And I want to I want to focus in on verse 26 with you tonight about what God's intent for you on how you used to live. God's got plans. Not because you're so good, but because He's so great. God has got something in store for you, not because of what your path and your plans come up to, but God has some things, but 
because he's got plans and he's got thoughts toward you. Y'all all know that Jeremiah 29, 11 verse, for I know the thoughts I think toward you, thoughts of good, not of evil, that you're going to prosper, that there's good things happening to you. That's God's intent. When we sit down and dwell a little bit, we start dwelling on the past and about how we're not worthy and, and how we're not, we're not good enough. And the devil whispers in our ear things that God's already forgiven and forgotten about and beats us down to the point that we don't feel like we can step out there and talk about the Lord. But verse 26 says that God says he, to us, He said, I'm going to put a new heart also in you, and I'm going to put a new spirit in you, and I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I'll put in you a heart of flesh. I'll put in something that's soft and pliable and that can be worked with and that can feel again. But as we go through this text tonight, I want to, I want to mark some things, and if you're taking notes, you, you please do so. Verse 16, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, God started talking. When God starts talking, we need to start listening. It says, Son of man, talking about that old prophet, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own way and by their doings. Their ways before me is an uncleanliness of a removed woman. It says, When they, lived, when they were living on their own, they were doing things their own way. Okay? Your ways are not God's ways. God has to establish His ways in you. Left to your own choices and so forth, you will, you will, you will live on your own. There's people here uh, in this town that they're not in a church service tonight. They're at home because, well, they, there's a football game on. Or there's a there's something else on TV, or, or 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 they're just pulling up tonight. You know they spent all day down on the river on the lake, and they got a cooler of fish, and they're going to be cleaning them fish up and stuff. They made their own way. They made their decision. This is the day of the Lord, though. Right, Amen. And Ezekiel said that when they dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own way, and by their own doings. That's where things get messed up, is when you and I start doing things our own way, the way we want to do, our choices. This morning I mentioned this thing, this, this thought, hopefully y'all grabbed it, on when you make a daily decision, these decisions you make out throughout, throughout the whole day. Do you pause just a moment and say, Lord, what would you want me to do in this? How would you want me to react? Now, you don't, you don't have to do that all the time if you start practicing it because whenever a certain situation comes up, you prayed about it, you sought God's will, and you went His way and not the choices that you would want, the next time that same situation comes up, then you know how to react. You don't have to stop and consider the Lord's way. You've already done it and applied it. So you know how you're going to react. And that's how you grow in the Lord. And that's how you start walking in His way instead of what Ezekiel's saying here, that when the people were walking in their land doing their own way, they defiled things. They messed things up. Now somewhere over here, and, and somewhere over here, it says that our righteousness is as filthy rags. The best we do, our righteousness, our right works, the way we behave ourselves the best to God is as right as is is as dirty, filthy rags. And then here he says that it says that uh, their way was before me as the uncleanliness of a removed woman. Okay. Now that's the King James version. Now the New Living Testament it it, it it says it a little bit differently, but it's it's like it's like uh, uh, the times during the monthly period of a, of a woman. Verse eighteen. Wherefore I poured my fury upon them for the blood that they had shed upon the land and for their idols wherewith they had polluted it. We go through life and we set up idols. Okay. Some of the idols we set up. Now, what? Let, let, let's define an idol for tonight if we can. Okay? An <coughs> idol is anything that you put up before God. That you serve rather than serving God. Now, that can be that can be a little uh, wooden carving in your home that you bow down and pray to. Hope to, hope, hope to Jesus you don't do that. Okay? But that's an idol. An idol can be 
something that, that you care for beyond the things of God. Okay? It can be a car. My goodness, uh, you know, uh, you, you get you a brand new uh, bright red Mustang GT with that big old heavy duty engine in it and those big old wide tires and that motor that will spin the tires and everything. That might be your idol. Okay? That you put before God. But you'll get out there and wash that thing before you make sure that uh, uh, the house of God is taken care of. And if you're making choices like that, then that Mustang GT has become an idol. An idol can also be uh, a period of time. It's, Preacher, I can't come to church on Sunday night because i got to get up and serve man, man on Monday morning uh, and, and, and it comes up early. And so I can't come into the house of God on Sunday night because I've got a man that I've set up as an idol, a job, an income, a security blanket, if you would. Okay? Now let me tell you what, I'm a grown man and there's been times I've been up for 36 hours straight. Now look, let me tell you what, when you're up for 36 hours straight, your head's not working too good. Your decision making abilities have happened. I understand that. But as a grown man, I have put in time where I'm, I'm tired, but still when people call, you got to answer and things you got to do. And yes, I've worked in, in, in corporate America where, where servers are down and you got to get in there and before Monday morning, those things have got to come up and I know what that means. Okay, when you got those deadlines and those pressures and that kind of thing, and this company's called you in at Friday night, and you go, well, I really wish I could have spent some time with my family and gone out to eat, and tomorrow's a Saturday, and I'm like, I have some time, and, and Lord, I don't know what, and you got to make a commitment to a company to go in and get a server going so a bank opens up over in India on Monday morning. And so you go in there and you pull everything out of your pockets and your and your and your phone and you can't bring anything that you can copy data over and you can't take any pictures in that and you sign in and 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 they start paying you and you work on those things and you work on them and work on them until they come up. Then you got to test them and make sure they're functioning and everything. And then you go to the security guard and you let them know and you sign out and you fill out some papers and you leave that place. And sometimes <laughs> Friday night you don't go to sleep. Okay, you work all Friday night and all day Saturday and Saturday afternoon and Saturday evening they're bringing food in because you can't leave. I've been in those situations. So I know what it is to work long hours and to be tired. So I understand whenever i got to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning and go serve man. I know what that means, but on Sunday you're supposed to be in the house of God taking care of your relationship with God. Why? Because that's God's way. Okay? Just simply, when y'all were little, you remember your parents, whenever they told you to do something and you said, why? And they said, because I said so. Sometimes God says so. It's because He says so. Yeah, I know. We don't like that sometimes, too. But we mess up things. They're idols. Wherewith they had polluted it. Where they, they had polluted their land. They had polluted their lives because they set up these idols. And we sit there and we, we don't come to church sometimes because we've set up an idol because we're answering to man. We're answering to money. Now I know money's necessary. I know that's important. But if you don't have to be at work until 6 o'clock tomorrow morning, you can be in church on Sunday night. There's a lot of hours between them. As grown adults, Maybe we don't get eight hours of sleep and we just function on four or five hours. We do that during football season, don't we? We stay up, watch those football games, and get up, we go to uh, work, and we're not dragging, we're going, did you see that play? Did you see the way he jumped out there and grabbed that ball? It was out of bounds and he never put his foot out. He was in bounds all the whole time, made that touchdown. Did you see that? And we're at work talking and sharing like that and God comes in and heals a tumor or brings somebody up and restores somebody and that kind of thing. Or God, God bless them. If, if, if we had three people except Jesus Christ and their Lord and Savior yesterday. And we sit there and we draw in and we quiet. But we, 
We can get energetic about a football game. We can get energetic about a, a, a fish we caught over the weekend and so forth. And Ezekiel's saying that they polluted their land. They polluted their lives because of the idols they set up. And an idol is anything that you set up before God. I know what it is to be tired. As your pastor, I know what it is to be tired. Working in corporate America, I know what it is to be tired and lack of sleep. I know what it is to be driven by schedules and demands of a boss and a company. I know what those are, so I'm talking to you with understanding here. But if we can stay up all night watching football games and we can get up and go to church, okay? God wants, God has a place that He wants in your life. He says that we pollute our land from the idols we set up. And look what he said in 19. I scattered them among the heathen. So he took his people and he scattered them out among the heathen. And they dispersed throughout the countries according to their way and according to their doings. He said, I judged them. And when they entered into the heathen, whither they went, they profaned my holy name. When they said to them, these are the people of the Lord and are gone forth out of his land. So the people went out. God's people went out and pro it said profane God's name. First of all, I want to point out that these people they did they they did their they had their doings. They they did their own way. They were out there. They were following things they had set up before God, and God let them go out among the rest of the world. And it said they profaned God's name. The day. We talk about bringing a reproach against the ministry of Jesus Christ. As Christians, we go out among the people and we use language that's not right. We tell jokes or laugh at jokes that aren't becoming. And we, we go places we're not supposed to go. We put things into our bodies that we're not supposed to be putting in. And people know that we've got a testimony that we're Christians. And that well, there's, they, they, they have some idea how we're supposed to act. And we're not acting that way. And we're profaning the name of of God Almighty. We're bringing a reproach against Christ's name. I look on Facebook and a lot of y'all are friends of mine on Facebook and I, and I enjoy sitting and looking at your postings and your thoughts and your ideas. I try to post things that are, uh, you know, if you follow me a little bit, you'll see some things. It's, it's, it says something that says just a thought. It's just something while I'm praying or something, the Lord enters into my head, and I go, wow, Lord, that's a good nugget. And I type that thing out and so forth, and I try to share it. It's uplifting, and it's inspiring to you. I hope it, it adjusts you and brings you back between the curves a little bit. If you've been out four-wheeling in the mud a little bit, maybe it'll bring you back in between the curves and get you back under control or give you something you can enjoy a little bit of the Lord and uh, make you think about it a little bit and, and, and so forth. But then I see some people that are sitting there and they got their arms over somebody in a solo cup or a beer bottle out there and they're in a bar. It's like, oh my Lord, they're a Christian. And not only are they drinking, or drinking, but they're drunk. And they're proud of it. They're, they're posting their pictures. And it's exactly what Ezekiel was saying. They, they're bringing... They're profaning the Lord's name. They're, they're bringing an odd reputation in on His name. We need to watch how we behave ourselves. As Christians, we it's not my reputation. My goodness, people laugh at me all the time. And if y'all been around me very long, I'll, I'll preach backwards to you every once in a while. I'll get the words all messed up and I'll start over and run at it again and so forth. And, and, and that's okay. Uh, I hope y'all enjoy that kind of thing and can laugh at your preacher sometimes about things like that. Now, I, I don't try to make mistakes and I try to correct those things, but I get going faster than my brain can keep up sometimes and I stumble over words. And, uh, uh, and, and, and as brothers and sisters, I want you to have a good time with me. 
But you can't, you can't go out and live in the world if you're blood and bought, born again. If the blood of Jesus Christ is a an atonement for your, for your sins and God's put them into the sea of forgetfulness and cast them out as far as the east is from the west and when you sit down one day and you get on your knees and you pray and say, Lord, forgive me for that thing 20 years ago that I did and Lord, from heaven sitting down going, I don't even know what you're talking about because I put my son's blood all over that thing and I can't remember it. It's been forgiven. But we're running around with the atonement and the covering of Jesus Christ's blood on our life. We're pulling it up and let sin in all the time and putting wrinkles all over what God's given us. What Ezekiel calls it is bringing, uh, uh, bringing profaneness into God's name. We're disturbing what his reputation is. It's not our reputation. When I go around town and I'm talking and I'm witnessing and I'm sharing with somebody and somebody starts talking, well, yeah, I, I was at that church and I saw them doing this and this and I heard the preacher was doing that and this other thing and the deacons were... And I sit there and, and that's the profaneness that's been brought into the ministry. Some of it's true, some of it's not. Some of it's just stories, I know that. But some of it is true. Some of it's got a base of truth. And the devil's working with it. But you know what? I've never heard people tell me the name of the person that was misbehaving. It was just a church member or that church or that pastor or a group of deacons or a group of people or a family. They don't put a name on that thing. But the one thing that they always have it connected to is the Lord Jesus Christ. So see, it's not your reputation that's getting messed up. It's Christ's. They're not connecting you and me in these stories, but they always connect Jesus to them. And Jesus didn't do that stuff. Jesus lived a perfect life. <coughs> he was without sin. And He went to that cross as a sacrifice for your and my sin. And He died. And as Christians, when we go and we say, I'm going to follow you, Lord, and I give my life to you, and God, I want you to forgive my sins, and I'm going to repent. And then we go through the world, and we bring that profaneness into God's name because of the way we act and, and the things that we set up as idols and, and that dirtiness that we bring into our lives. The world looks at it. And they don't hold it against your account. Listen to what they said. When they said unto me, These are the people of the Lord and are gone forth out of His land. The New Living Translation says, Aren't these God's people? And He can't even keep them straight? It's the Lord's reputation we're messing with. It's not our reputation. We're sitting thinking, oh, well, we got a right to behave the way we want to. And we can do this to our bodies if we want to. And we can act that way if we want to. But the world is saying, isn't this God's people? And can't He even keep them straight? They're accusing God Almighty. They're not accusing you and me. Now, I know this is Old Testament, but you might have well read this out of yesterday's newspaper. This is current information. God's word is true. There's no lies in this book. And he's explaining how the world reacts to you and me when we're out misbehaving. But I had pity for my holy name. Now listen to that, verse 21. But I had pity for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen whither they went. They messed up my name among the world. Everywhere they went, they messed up my name. But God says, I have pity on my name. On his name. <clears throat> Verse 22. Therefore say, therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes. Wow, I thought God did everything for us. I thought he was out for our benefit all the time. But now Ezekiel's sitting there saying, listen, I don't do this for your sakes. O house of Israel, put your name in there. But for my holy name's sake, 
which you have proclaimed among the heathen wherever you went. God is interested in his reputation. We run around and we defame his name, we profane his name, the King James says, but we bring a reproach, a, a bad report, if you will, toward his name. Because people are looking at us and say, you're Christians. Aren't you a Christian? Yeah. Well, why are you acting that way? Look at how Christians act. Well, I don't want to act that way. That's nasty. That's dirty. What did he say? Like a woman's menstrual period? Nobody wants to follow that. We're not a good witness when we profane God's name, when we act unchristian like, when we do things, <coughs> say things, have attitudes that aren't right. And the Bible tells us that wherever they went, they were profaning the name among the world. The <coughs> Verse 23, and I will sanctify, which means to separate, to set aside. I will set aside my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which you have profaned in the middle of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. I will sit down and I will sanctify, I will set aside my name. And in doing so, I'll end up sanctifying and setting you apart too. I will separate you from among the heathen. I will make you a peculiar people, the Bible says in another place. I will set a, a different type of people, a godly people, a holy nation. God says he'll work on you. Okay, why? For his name's sake. There's a lot of preaching today about do it yourself. And, and what was the thing that was going around uh, from this uh, group out of Texas of when you're praising God, do it for your own self. Don't do it, don't do it because uh, for God, but do it for your own sake because that God, that's what God wants you to do is to be yourself happy. Okay? That's not what I'm reading in Ezekiel. God's sitting there saying he's concerned about his name and his reputation. And his name is holy. And he's going to separate it from among you, from among the heathen. He's going to make it different. It's going to be sanctified. It's going to be set apart. And in doing so, he will set his people apart from the world. Now this was to the Jewish nation. This was the children of Israel, it's Old Testament. But if we wanted to go down look, God's the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? He doesn't change. And if we're God's people, he's going to do the same thing for us. He's going to sit down. He's going to protect his name in this world. And he's going to uh, he's going to chastise you and me. He's going to bring us into order and so forth. But he's going to sanctify his name. He's going to make his name holy among the world. And the heathen one day every knee's going to bow and every tongue's going to confess and confess Jesus as Lord. And he's not he can't do that unless he sanctifies his name. He can't depend on us to keep it straight all the time. But he's going to work on us. And he says and I'm going to sanctify you. I'm going to set you apart. I'll make you holy too. See, he's a big God. So even though we, we mess up all the time, God's big enough, he's going to take care of his name, and he's going to take care of you and me too. He's a good God. He loves us. So this isn't just a message of getting on to you, but it's a message of letting you know how big God is and how great he is, and that he's concerned about his reputation, and he's also going to sanctify and strengthen and separate you out too. He's going to bring you right along if you're his children. Verse 24, For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. And I will sprinkle clean water upon you. He's going to sprinkle clean water. Now, now I know we're Baptists and we get up totally immersed. You can go dump it in it if you want to, but God's going to sprinkle you. So there's a little bit of uh, foothold for the Methodists there, I guess. Okay? But he's not talking about baptizing. He's talking about cleaning you up. He said, I'm going to sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean from all your filthiness. I'm going to clean you up. And from all your idols, he's going to break them down. Well, I cleanse you. Verse 26, the key verse tonight, and a new heart also will I give you. I don't, I don't know about you, but I know there's times in my life that I just, Lord, 
you can dump the whole heart out of me because it ain't no good. It's rotten to the core. I don't even feel. I think I shared here at one time that there was a point in my life I didn't break tears. I, you know, uh, I didn't cry. I, would, I got myself hardened up to the point where it did, I didn't feel the people and that kind of thing. And, and, you know, after a few years of that, it was like, Lord, please let me cry. Break my heart. Break me down again. I got to feel you. I want that new heart. Okay? And then I see you get there studying and says, and I'm going to give you a new heart. A new heart will I give you also. And a new spirit. Oh, my goodness, I need a new spirit. I need that spirit to get up and, and shout with just a few people or 1,500. It don't matter. I want the kind of spirit. It don't matter how, what the numbers are. I want to celebrate God. I want to come alive. I want to sit down and celebrate. I want to clap. I want to raise my hands. I want to have a good time in the Lord because He's worthy. Not because of me. Not because of what I can offer. I can't sing that good. My voice is cracking from hollering and preaching and all that kind of stuff. But I can sit down and I can lift up my voice and I can praise God because because of who he is, not because of who I am. And he says, I'm going to get, put a new heart in you. And I'll give you a new spirit. I'll also put that new spirit in you. And after the world tears on you and wears on you a little bit, you know what I mean. You need a new spirit. You need something that will climb out and holler a little bit. Because it's alive and it's got strength in it. You need that spirit about you. God says, I'll put that new heart in you. And I'll put a new spirit in you. Not only is he going to put that new heart in you, but look, and I will take away that stony heart out of your flesh. I'll take away the hardness out of you. I'll take that hard, stony place out of your flesh, and I'll give you a heart of flesh. <coughs> if you had a diseased heart tonight that the doctor said is failing, and one day it's going to quit beating, and it ain't pumping the way it's supposed to pump. And the doctor said, the only thing I can do is put a pacemaker in. You sit there, doctor, put that pacemaker in. Don't let this thing stop. <coughs> that become a priority in your life to get that thing fixed. Or if the doctor said, we're going to have to split you open. And I'm going to have to go in there and I'm going to have to take, and take a, a valve out. We're going to have to take and put another one in there. But that'll fix you. You sit there, little doctor, cut me open. Don't let this stop. You keep that going, doctor, whatever you got to do. And you're going to sit down and say, that's a major surgery. Your recovery time's going to be rough. It's a hard surgery. You're going to, doctor, you don't make this stop. You keep this going. Or maybe your heart's diseased to the point they're going to say, we're going to have to take that heart out of you. We're going to have to find a donor heart and transplant a heart in you. Or you're going to die. That heart's going to quit beating. You're going to look at that doctor and say, whatever you guys do, doctor, you don't stop this thing. God's sitting there. And he's telling you tonight, you got a problem with your heart. And I'm going to have to take that old stony thing out. And I'm going to have to give you a new one. Why don't we sit down and say, Lord, you do whatever you got to do to keep my heart going. Whatever you got to do, Lord, keeping my heart running after you, pursuing you, <coughs> you do it. Lord, if it's just a pill I can take and get over, Lord, give me a pill. Lord, if you've got to replace the vow, Lord, replace that vow. Lord, don't, don't let me stop. Lord, if you've got to take the whole thing out and throw it because it's just nothing but a rock and put in a, a new heart of flesh, Lord, don't let me grow cold. Lord, don't grow me. Let me grow hard and indifferent. I'm going to put in you a new heart, God says. Because your idols and your ability to profane my name has caused a problem. And I'm going to protect my name. And I'm going to sanctify you too. I'm going to set you up separate. 
verse 26, and I'm going to give you a new heart. I'm going to take out of you that stony heart and I'll give you a heart of flesh again. Jesus explained it as the new birth. I'm going to give you the heart of a brand new baby. One that's designed to beat a long time. One designed to do everything that you think you're going to be called to do. That new birth. I'm going to give you that heart that's going to handle everything, every bit of load that you ever put on it. I'm going to give you a new heart. Some of you who don't do this life, you know your heart's hardened. You know you've been disobedient sometimes and made a mess of things. The good news is, is God's interested in His name. And while He takes care of His name, He's going to sanctify you. He's going to take care of you too. God's going to protect His name. And in the eyes of the heathen, He said He's going to set you apart. That, you, that the world knows you're different. The way He does that is through Jesus Christ and His blood. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ, you need to. That's how you get the first new heart. And if you walked along and allowed yourself to get hardened, now I'm not saying you're off into deep, deep dark sin somewhere, but you know whether or not, whether or not you've toughened yourself up. Maybe it's because uh, you felt that was the right thing to do. You need to toughen up because, well, preacher, you cry all the time. That's silly. There's something wrong with you because you cry all the time. No, there ain't nothing wrong with me. God broke my heart and made it soft. And it don't take a whole lot for me to feel him. And I'm glad. Okay? And I'm glad about that. I was hard one time where I didn't cry. And I couldn't let the Spirit touch me. And I would, you wouldn't have tears running down the side of my nose and that kind of thing. And I just keep on preaching to you. Nobody got saved. But when the Spirit of God comes in and breaks that thing, the Spirit of God starts moving in your life. And you can become effective again. And God wants to put a new heart. Tonight, is there anybody that needs Jesus? You've never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. Is there anybody in this place tonight that needs Jesus? If you realize you're a sinner, you need God to forgive you of your sin. You need Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You need to come right now. We've got a <coughs> invitation going.